The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to come. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore, the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and salute no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town where they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come upon you. I tell you, it shall be more tolerable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Now the 72 went and returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one. St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, Far be it from me to glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does this mean? And how does this statement challenge you your own life. Question two. Identify at least two elements that link to this gospel reading very closely with last Sunday's gospel reading in case you have forgotten. Luke 9, 51 to 62. Question three. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, quote, do not rejoice that the evil spirits or demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 20. What do you think Jesus meant? Question four. List some of the ways in which we Christians are being called to be messengers of Christ's peace to the men and women of our country today in the circumstances of today. Uchi. 
I want to attempt question number three. Yes. Do not rejoice that the evil spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What do you think Jesus meant when he said that? I think Jesus was trying to point his disciples to the ultimate aim of being a disciple. That's heaven at last. He was trying to tell them that by being a disciple of Christ, God has already died and has defeated the powers of devil. So every power on earth, under the earth and all that, they obey Christ. So you have dominion over evil spirits, demons and such. But that was the... That's not by the focus. The way. Yeah. That's by the way. So don't focus Let's give so her a much. round of applause for saying that. That is by, by the, the way. way. That's not so the focus of the Christian life. That's not the focus of being called to be a disciple. In as much as, yes, you have such power, so don't dwell on it. Focus on what is important, and that's making heaven at last. So he was trying, because he knows human nature will try to focus on, I have power as a Christian, I can do this as a disciple. The devil will bow to me. I have authority over demons. Those things are true. They are not lie, but those are not the main aim. Those are not the focus. The ultimate goal of being a disciple of Christ is for our names to be written in heaven. That's heaven at last. Thank Many you. Many years ago, I was um, chaplain. I was chaplain to the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and I was involved in the National Catholic Charismatic Renewal and the body of chaplains. And my experience is that when it comes to demons and witches our people get really excited and then when there are manifestations indications that ah when we call the name of jesus there are manifestations people get 10 times excited but what today's gospel is saying is that that is not that's not important because you can do all that and not get to heaven because it is Jesus' power, it is not your power. So the fact that you call the name of Jesus and people are manifesting and people are falling down and rolling on the ground, that doesn't show you are really a Christian. Are you getting that point? That doesn't show nothing. That's why Jesus is warning them, don't rejoice over that. Your joy should be that your names are written in there. That is, that is your focus. That's our goal. Because people can get so distracted by entertainment. In fact, we got to a point in this country where deliverance has become entertainment. I mean, when you do deliverance before, before TV camera, that's a horrible abuse. By, by our discipline in the church, you don't do any such thing called deliverance or, or exorcism in public. But it is entertaining. And people are exchanging demons all over the place. <laughs> Very entertaining. By our discipline in the Catholic Church, before anyone is present at a deliverance or exorcism session, that person would have prepared for months with prayer and fasting. Before anybody is present. Even before a dog or a cat is present. Because dog or cat are living creatures. They can carry demons. So you don't let any such people present. Not to talk of human beings who are just coming out of bear pallor to be present there. So there's a lot of abuse in this country because of so much excitement. Even the one who is laughing and shouting during deliverance when somebody else is rolling on the ground, face him and begin to call the name of Jesus, he too falls down. <laughs> So it, it, became, it has become what? Entertainment. And we need to face the real issue. That the real issue is our journey to the kingdom. The real issue is our journey to the kingdom. Are we living the life of heaven today to assure us that we are candidates of heaven? Are we living that life today? Because when we are with all our addictions, all our, our selfishness, our avarice, our, our pride, our arrogance, our greed, our uh, native um, 
uh, inclination to hold on to things, attachments, attachment to our culture. That is how we do it in our place. Our male chauvinism, our superstition, our fetishism. I mentioned, was it last Sunday here, that today there is, there is an upsurge in fetishism, in cultism, and in primitive superstition. Yet, our churches are full and people are doing deliverance. People are doing night vigils. They are going prayer mountains, all kinds of things. And they are turning out to be nonsense. They are turning out not to be nonsense because they are not delivering the goods. As long as the hearts of human beings are not being transformed for Christ, all this is what? Nonsense. If the hearts of human beings are not being transformed. Let's talk more about this because this is what I spend my time in for 21 days doing at retreat, reflecting on all this and asking myself, what's, what's all this? What am I doing with my life? What are Christian priests and pastors doing with their life? What are Christians in Nigeria doing with their life? What's all this? Just moving around circles and going nowhere. Am I just maintaining a will and going nowhere? Everywhere I go, people say, oh, we watch you. Oh, we watch you. Every Sunday we watch you. So what? I don't want to be a celebrity. It is celebrities that people watch and it doesn't transform their lives. I don't want to be a celebrity. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to me that you watch me if you are not marching daily towards heaven. So do not rejoice that the devil bow when you call the name of Jesus. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And how will your names be written in heaven? Jesus has given us the prescriptions of what will make your names to be written in heaven. Yes, Chichi, before I come to you, Helen. I think for me, the second element, you know, um, that comes to number two is the Jesus refocusing people on what's important and wanting to take away from the disciples the pride in the in the let me say, in the goods that they get from following Jesus. So in, the, in last Sunday's um, reading, the disciples wanted to call down fire Aha. on the people. And, and this week... And, because and the they day, knew the power they had. Yes. And they wanted to use and celebrate that power by calling down fire. Yes. And Jesus said, forget it. And then the, this Sunday again, the uh, 72 were rejoicing that they were The able devils to, were uh, bowing to them. And Jesus said, forget it. So um, for, in, in both um, Gospels, Jesus is trying to show that what is important is not, you know, all the razzmatazz. Let's just, Thank uh, you. Put it not that all way, the razzmatazz. You know, um, of the Gospel, but really focusing on the word and, and, um, and what it means to be a Christian, which is really um, heaven. Thank you. Give a round of applause. Okay, question one. Bishop. I'd like to answer question one. Yes. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, Far be it from me to glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does this mean? Glory that St. That Paul is talking about is heaven. And it means that he can't be close to heaven without... The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Cannot be close to heaven without the cross of Jesus, yes. It also means that, that since the cross of Christ is the center of Christianity. Correct. That he won't be close from to heaven except he is a Christian. Okay, give him an applause. Yes, <laughs> Helen, you want to help him? Okay. Did you read your commentary this week? Did you read your commentary? Uh, okay. Um, I think what he meant was also that the things of the world are passing things. When you gloat in your successes and so on, it doesn't lead you anywhere. That what leads you to eternal life is the cross of Christ. And the cross of Christ means that you are going to suffer whatever you suffer is also that you know that at the end of it, this too shall pass, and I'm going to go to my destination without distractions. And how this sentence, I mean, challenges me statement is that 
Sometimes I look at my own successes. Okay, I'm not yet a professor, but I'm an associate professor. So what? That won't take me to heaven. What will take me to heaven is a cross of Christ. Or I have a beautiful old car. Would that take me to heaven? No. It's not old, though. Yes, it's old. It's and not then, old, though. Is her car old? No. Ah. So, you want to exchange it with my own? <laughs> so, sometimes, Father, when we don't look at the cross of Christ, envy takes over us, and envy is the seed of sin. You look at, um, who has a beautiful car here? Um, you, and you want to ride their car. You don't know the sufferings they are going through. So what is telling us that the cross of Christ, that is what is life. That's the center of Christianity. And whatever I go through for the cross of Christ is meaningful to me because it's leading me to my destination. First of all, it is very clear in the, all the letters of St. Paul, the centrality of the cross. Yes. Meaning the centrality of the foolishness of the cross that is wiser than human wisdom. Jesus says, if anyone wishes to follow me, unless he re renounces his life, takes off his cross every day. And what does that cross mean? It means suffering. No one can live the Christian life without suffering, especially in an evil world like we are in. And what has put us where we are is that people are thinking that they can have sugar in the morning and sugar in the evening and sugar in the afternoon too and be living the Christian life. It's not possible. Because the more dark the environment, the more corrupt the environment, the more unchristian the environment, the more difficult it will be for you to give witness to Christ. Because you don't have the social support. You don't have the social support. I mean, every time I stop by a traffic light, you'll see 10, 20 cars come and pass you by and in fact begin to insult you. They begin to insult you because you have been foolish. But that doesn't happen in a society where there is law and order. Tunde, where you are coming from? In Beijing. Does it happen that way? It doesn't happen in a society where there is law and order. Meaning that we in this society, things have, we have gone so degenerate that the one who wants to keep the law the one who wants to run, live his life by the rule of law, live his life by simple elements of decency, he or she suffers a lot. Each time I stop by the traffic light, I get insulted. I get insulted by people who see that I'm foolish. I mean, why, why are you wasting our time? Because there's no support. If the society were a God-fearing, orderly society, it is easier to be a Christian. Right? It would be easier to be a Christian because you want to um, you want to do the right thing. There is support for you to do the right thing. Today you want to do the right thing. You are the odd person out. And you think you can live the Christian life in this kind of corrupt nation and everybody will be celebrating you? No. It is not possible. May the Lord help us. Isaiah as a messenger of glad tidings. You see, if you take today's first reading and look at it closely, and the glad tidings in that Isaiah 66, 10 to 14, you ask yourself, at what time was this passage written? It was written at one of some of the worst times in Israelite history like the kind of times we are going through. But it was a message of hope. I keep telling you about prophetic imagination. How, when things are bad, really bad, like we are experiencing in this country, it is the role of a prophet of God to give hope to the people. That God is near. Liberation is near. Salvation is near. But... The prophet, and we Christians, as you know, by virtue of our baptism, we are supposed to be priests, prophets, and kings. The prophet, like every Christian, is supposed to be living that new life he or she is desiring to come. It will not come soon unless we are already beginning to live it. 
by making efforts to live our dreamed for life, then we bring it nearer home. The prophets attempted to live the kind of life they were dreaming of for their people. Prophet Jeremiah, Prophet Baruch, Prophet Zephaniah, Amos, Hosea, they, they tried to live the kind of life they were praying will become the life of everybody. If we are the prophets of our people, how are we living that life? How are we modeling the life of the kingdom? If all we tell ourselves is that everybody is doing it, if all we tell ourselves is that this is Nigeria, this is what works, then that new life will be long in coming. It will be long in coming. At a time of great suffering and tribulation, Prophet Isaiah gives a very cheering prophecy to the people as we heard in our first reading. Now, coming to Jesus. Jesus came and announced that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, that he has come. Isaiah 61, 1-3, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring good news to the afflicted, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the lost year of favor. He went about instructing the ignorant, healing the sick, freeing people from the devil's bondage, from oppressive social structures. He said he had come that we may have life and have it in abundance, John 10:10. 10, 10. Having stayed with the disciples for a while, it was now time to send them out to proclaim to others the good news which they themselves have heard. Indeed, brothers and sisters, to receive Jesus is to be sent out. What did I say? You know, I have kept saying here and in recent times even more, that if you have been coming, you have joined me for the past six, five, four, three years, you should be pastors now and pastesses. You should be equipped to go out there and preach to people and transform people. You can't, you can't come and just be sitting down here and be receiving all the time. You're just receiving. No, 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 no. You know, I even said, look, if you are here and you are not doing anything engaged in promoting the gospel and we cannot see, let me kick you out so that there may be space for more people because it's a very small place. This is not a place for maintenance, just to maintain what is. This is a place to be trained to go out. Do you understand what I'm saying? To receive Jesus is to be sent out. I have constantly said here that after coming here for the past six or five or four or three years, you cannot just be receiving. By now, you should become pastors and pastors, evangelists, prophets and prophetesses. You should be equipped because some of those who are running around and teaching all kinds of strange doctrine have not received the kind of formation you have received true so consider yourself equipped and if you are not equipped then something is wrong to go and speak about Christ to others to go and speak about Christian values to others in the kind of society that we are in the harvest is indeed rich but the laborers are few when Jesus said the harvest is rich the laborers are few he's not talking of just the number of human beings that are laboring it's authentic labor as he's talking about. Authentic. Not cash and carry missionaries. Not people who are looking for money and have found the gullibility and the vulnerability of Nigerians a suitable uh, um, uh, garden to harvest money. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Authentic laborers are few. People preaching the truth of the gospel are few. People who are promoting the gospel that transforms, they are very few. What we have all over the place are opportunists. Opportunists that are cashing in and smiling to the bank on account of the gullibility and the vulnerability of Nigerians who have remained in their fetish superstitious disposition and call themselves Christians. It is the gullibility of Nigerians. It is the vulnerability of Nigerians. It is our fetishism. It is our superstition that is making many such people smile to the bank every day. But they themselves need conversion. They need conversion. 
Otherwise, they will account before God for abusing the people for selfish gain, for exploiting the people for selfish gain. To encounter Jesus is to immediately become a missionary. Missionary work is not business. Missionary work is not an investment. Missionary work is not an incorporation. Missionary work is hard. Jesus told them in today's gospel, Luke chapter 10, go your way, but carry no purse, no haversack. Even be so busy that you have no time to be saluting people on the road. To receive the light of Christ is to become light to others. Jesus says, no one who follows me will ever walk in darkness. I am the light of the world. No one who follows me will ever walk in darkness. If there is still so much walking in darkness in our society, in spite of churches on every street, what it means is that it is not Jesus we are following. If it is Jesus we are following, he says, by their fruits you shall know them. The fruits we are seeing in our country are not fruits of righteousness. They are not fruits of godliness. They are not fruits of holiness. So we ourselves should become clear that it is not the gospel of Christ that we are following. It's something else. The gospel of Christ, I insist, is the most potent force for social transformation, for individual transformation. So if individuals are not being transformed and society, our society is not being transformed and we still claim that it is the gospel of Christ we are following, where? To feed at the table of the Lord is to eat the bread of life and it is to become bread broken for others. We can't eat the bread of life and continue to live a life of selfishness. It is not possible. We can't eat the bread of life, the bread of the one who says, this is my body broken for you, who gave himself up on the cross for our salvation. We can't eat that bread of life and remain greedy and selfish and avaricious, me, myself, and I, and be gathering what is meant for thousands of people, what is meant for the common good, and privatize uh, government, make the commonwealth for ourselves and our family alone. We can't eat the body of Christ and continue to live that kind of life. Degenerate life. It is not possible. The disciples were to carry no purse, yes, no haversack, no sanders. They were to salute no one on the road. They were to eat whatever is set before them. Not to go from house to house. They were to stay in whichever house welcomes them. Because they could be distracted. If they hear that uh, Victor Emema's house has better food and then they move to Victor Emema's house, if they were in Uche's house and then uh, they are not enjoying the food and they move to Victor's house, they say, no, if they welcome you. No, no, no. <laughs> if they welcome you, stay there and eat whatever they offer you. So that you don't waste time. What does this show? Like last Sunday. Urgency. So between last Sunday and this Sunday, the message of what? The urgency of the kingdom. So urgent that you have no time to be saluting people along the road. So urgent that you have no time to go through all the menus and change your mind. <laughs> to carry no purse, no haversack means do not put your trust in your Possessions. I, I felt so I felt so sad, so offended as I watched a number of videos in, in, in the course of the week about some some church whose who's, who's stock in trade is how flashy, how rich and flashy their environment is and, and the custom design clothes that the pastor wears and the people wear and the hairstyle that the people wear and so on and so forth. What have we done with the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ does not need anything material to advertise it. What did I say? Does not need anything material. I don't need Gucci to advertise the gospel of Christ. I don't need any, any, any material thing to use to advertise the gospel of Christ. There is power in the gospel on its own. And you reduce the gospel of Christ. God forgive my people. You reduce the gospel of Christ when you use anything material to advertise it. Even to use miracle to advertise it. 
any benefit, any material benefit to advertise the gospel of Christ. Not even miracles should be used to advertise the gospel of Christ. There is power in the gospel of salvation. My people have been misled. My people have been, have been led into some quality of Christianity that does not qualify to be called Christianity at all. Do not rely on your own power and what security you can provide for yourself. Otherwise, you will fail to be witnesses of Jesus who goes before you ensuring your safety. Before you go, Jesus says, I will be there. Do not worry about what you are to say because when, you, when the time comes, what you are to say will be given to you. If you put trust in your possessions, you will fail to recognize Jesus the provider. If you put trust in your power, in your security, in your connections, and the powerful people you are connected to, then you will fail to witness to Jesus who goes before you. If it, as Christians we are attached and bound to worldly possessions, we will be tempted to compromise and we will fail to announce that the kingdom of God is at hand. Because worldly possessions, worldly power, worldly connections, celebrity status and so on, what they do is that they revert us to this world. They all often amount to these worldly ultimate goals as against transcendental ultimate goals. As we keep saying here, and my people are stuck. My people appear stuck in these worldly ultimate goals. This is what is preventing us from authentic religiosity. In an environment and in an age of acute materialism and secularism, in an age of vainglory and vanity all over the place, in an age where people's image is more important than content, branding is more important than the product, in such an age of empty, shallow, hollow, wishy-washy superficiality, in such an age, Christians are supposed to be the content and provide the content. Everybody is just talking about camouflage. We're just, we're just concerned with the facade. Poorly, poorly built house where everything is, is, is falling apart. The, the mechanical and engineering part of the house are horrible, but the facade of the house. This is what we're doing with Christianity. Just facade. You see people coming out of the church, fine, fine clothes, including uniforms of different groups. But there's no content. There's no content because right there at the parking lot, you cannot see evidence of people who have just encountered the Lord Jesus, who have just eaten the body of Jesus and taken his blood, who have been transformed and has been sent into the world to transform the world. You can't see evidence of that. I told you last Sunday, I am getting tired of that kind of life. I really, I can't, I don't want to continue with that kind of life. And if you people want to, if that's the kind of Christian life you want to live, I won't be your pastor. I won't. The heavy baggage Christians carry include our inordinate desire for what? Power, prestige, influence. This is it. How fast can this, this guy run? How far can he go? The message of Jesus is that of urgency, urgency of the kingdom. This guy, like you see many Nigerians at, at airports, in Heathrow, in Amsterdam, in Paris, trying to come back home and trying to check in their load, and then when they say their luggage is too heavy, then they start having hand luggages, which they hope that at the, at the point of entry that they will take it off them without their pain. You see them with heavy 30 kilos, 30 kilos, as backpack, 30 kilos as hand luggage. With that kind of thing, we can't get anywhere. Our excessive pursuit of wealth and attachment to material possessions, our excessive attachment to children and relations, 
I mean, people think that as long as it's a human being, if my attachment is to my wife or my husband or my children, it is okay. It is not okay if it is too much. Jesus does not want us to be attached to anything. Vanity of vanities. Do you consider that wife, husband, children belong to the vanities Jesus is talking about? It's part of the vanity. Because we are going to leave them here. We are not taking anyone away. Many Christians are weighed down, bogged down, ensnared, enslaved by material possessions. The fear of losing our privileges and the fear of going out of favor with the rich and the powerful often make us compromise gospel values and principles. Every day we are compromising. When Jesus tells the disciples to leave behind the guarantee of shelter and support and set off without possessions, it means they are to depend solely on the peace of the kingdom which they bear. The hosp hospitality of total strangers who receive them is part of trust in God. It means that they have something to offer the people in their preaching and healing and in return the people will have something to offer the disciples. What it means is that gospel preachers should recognize that they have something. No authentic preacher of the gospel will go hungry. Because they, they have something that the people need. And so they don't need to worry. They don't need to worry. Last Sunday I said, you know, all kinds of initiative about fundraising. I consider it a distraction. Didn't I say that last Sunday? I consider it a distraction. Because I have got to the point where I know that if, the, if it is God's work I am doing, what I need will be supplied to me. And you know, I keep saying to you that you either join the work of Jesus and support what I am doing or it will be done without you. I keep saying the preacher has no business begging for money. Reason is that if it is Jesus' work, one is that if you are a Christian, you should feel privileged to be part of it. You should feel privileged to be part of it. And so when a preacher stands up and is begging and begging and appealing and appealing, I am doubting whether it is the gospel of Christ is preaching. I am doubting whether it is the message of, the God, message of Jesus he has. Because if it is the message of Jesus, if you are not part of it, it will be, the work will be done without you. If it is Jesus' work, it will come to pass. I say these things and people sit down and say, oh, this guy is very arrogant. But that's the truth. That's the truth. Jesus says, start now. Start off now. Urgent. Go quickly. Urgent. Waste no time saluting people. Urgent. Don't try adjusting the menu. Urgent. Because all that will be a waste of time. Jesus knew that he didn't have much time. He knew that he must rely on the talents and the understanding of his followers. He also knew that the territory out there is rough and tough. Is the territory not rough and tough? Is the Nigerian society not rough and tough? Are our homes not rough and tough? We just finished a trauma healing program, psychotrauma healing program. The average Nigerian is traumatized. Unfortunately, we don't know. We only recognize the people in Aru Mental Hospital. Many people don't know that as you sit down here, most people are traumatized. People who come for our trainings, who are doctors and psychologists and social workers and so on, who are coming to train to go and be trauma healers, we discover that almost all of them are traumatized in need of healing. Halfway through the course, they break down. And rather than go to the Lord and seek proper healing, all we often do, spending all our time, in asking for more material things. The same things that have led to our distress. It was Albert Einstein that said that you do not solve a problem with the same consciousness that created the problem. You do not solve a problem with the same consciousness that created the problem. You need a different level of consciousness to solve a problem created by one level of consciousness. 
And it is true. We keep doing the same thing in the same way and we are looking for different kind of result. You know, how are you going to get it? We need to change our ways. We need to change our focus. We need to change our priorities if things are going to change in our individual and corporate lives. To survive, one must live the radical lifestyle of the wandering preacher, renouncing family and property, and sometimes being homeless. Upon their return, the disciples rejoiced that the people welcomed the word of God, that they never lacked anything, that the devil submitted to them when they used the name of Jesus, that their mission was what? Successful. Our God is the God of all goodness, but today's world is torn apart by human greed and selfishness, wickedness and vengeance, violence and crime, multiple tragedies all over the place. Our national landscape is polluted by widespread violence, large-scale corruption, the crave for power by all manner of means, executive lawlessness, impunity at all levels, lack of commitment to the common good. Indeed, the harvest is rich and the laborers are few. Religion for many is no more than empty ritual. It, religion has no transforming influence in the life of many people, as I keep saying. Many carry on without fear of God. Many are devoted to the cult of mammon. Jesus says you cannot serve God and mammon. But many people think they can combine it. One of the miracles of Nigeria is how we have managed to combine the worship of mammon with vibrant Christianity. Many are devoted to the cult of mammon, pursuing money blindly and pursuing sensual pleasure without restraint. Indeed, my brothers and sisters, the harvest is rich and the laborers are few. The Christian virtue of love, of forgiveness, of compassion, of humility, frugality, purity of heart have no place in the life of many. Many have never heard the good news. Others have been fed with chaff. Indeed, the harvest is rich and the laborers are few. I mean, when you consider the abject, dehumanizing, disgraceful poverty in our environment, whether it is in the villages or around the cities, when you consider that, and Nigerians will take a plane full of people and go to Dubai for a wedding, and go to the seven-star hotel in Dubai for a wedding, and finish hundreds of millions for a wedding or for some birthday or whatever, and including pastors doing the same. Indeed, the harvest is rich. So such pastors are part of the harvest, isn't it? They are part of the harvest. Such Christians are part of the harvest. My disposition is that let's not consider ourselves Christians. Let us say that we want to be Christians. Because you see, if we told ourselves that we are already Christians, then we think we are there. Let us say that we, like that man who came to Jesus and said, you know, Lord, I like you last Sunday. I like you. I like your life. I would like you to follow you. But I beg, make her go bury my hair. Let's say we are at that level. Because by the time we listen, if we were really listening, by the time Jesus Christ rolls out the condition for us, we will be among those who are scratching our head and go away sad. My people are not yet prepared for Christianity. That's where I stand today. And that's where I am beginning to evaluate my own life and my own work and asking myself, do I want to continue among a people who do not want to be Christians? Among a people who have adjusted Christianity to themselves. We are supposed to adjust our life to fit the gospel, isn't it? But what have we done? We are adjusting the gospel to fit our lives so that we remain where we are. And I'm not going to be part of that. I won't be part of it. We witness human suffering on a large scale. Sick people unattended to all over the place. Handicapped people neglected all over the place. Poor children abandoned to the streets. Widows and orphans with no social security. Gradu young graduates with no employment. The urban poor condemned to the slums. Childless couples in pain. Young women searching in vain for suitable life partners. Victims of violent crimes, terrorist attacks, kidnappers all over the place. Yes, the harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. And while all this is happening, some of us are carrying on as if nothing is happening, as if everything is okay. We see children on the streets. Two days ago, I saw at 9 p.m., a woman 
carrying a child and selling a bottle of granite. At 9 p.m., a woman carrying a baby at the back selling a bottle of granite on the streets. It is unacceptable. And we should all consider it unacceptable and cry and think of what we can do as individuals and as groups not to let that happen. As a sorry sight. I get sleepless nights if I pass by such a person. It's not enough to give five, thousand, five, five, uh, five naira or ten naira or twenty naira or hundred naira to such a person. The next day, the person will be back there. So what can we do? What can our society do? And we are not completely helpless. We are not completely helpless. We are all called to be laborers in the lost vineyards. We are called to be gatherers and harvesters. I told you, you cannot be coming to this church and just be receivers. You are meant to go out and be harvesters and gatherers. Witnesses of God's love and, and, and uh, 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 amid selfishness and hate. Peacemakers in the midst of what? Conflict and violence. Truth bearers in the midst of falsehood and deceit. Bridge builders in the midst of division and dissension. Healers and comforters in the midst of sick and distressed people. That is what we are meant to be. I told you that the Christian life is such that you are either actively paddling or you sink. You cannot float on top of the water. Only dead bodies, corpses float. The Christian life is about life, vitality, vivaciousness. You cannot float. You are either actively paddling or you sink. Many people think that they can just be floating along for years. They will tell you that they have been going to church for 30 years, 40 years. But nothing has changed in their life. The fundamental orientation is still that of the grandfather and great grandmother who, have, who never heard about Jesus Christ. That's the fundamental orientation of many Nigerians about power. About power. About pleasure. In fact, grandfathers and grandmothers were often better. Today, the level of vanity if my great grandfather came back to this world and sees the level of vanity, he will run back. He will run back. He will say, what kind of godless people are these? And yet, we say we are Christians. Like I said, I am beginning to challenge the, the fundamental assumption that, that we are Christians. I'm challenging it. What kind of Christianity is this? This is not the Christianity I studied. This is not the Christianity that the early Christians lived. This is not the Christianity I want to live. May have been saying my own. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. For those who have eyes to see and the hearts to respond, the harvest is indeed plentiful. But the opportunities for peace are also plentiful for those who have eyes to see and the eyes to the hearts to respond. The opportunities are plentiful. The opportunities to make a difference. Each one of us can make enormous difference. If you only have the eyes to see and the heart to respond. For Jesus, every day is harvest day. Harvest day is not one day. For Jesus, every day is harvest day. And everyone who has not fully embraced Jesus and societies that have not fully embraced his way of life, they are the field where the harvest is to take place. All who have truly encountered Jesus must get involved in the urgent task of saving the world from sin and corruption, violence and death. All of us. I did say, and I'm going to emphasize it more when we finish Mass, if you are going to belong to Luke Stella Chapel, you will sign and let me know what you are going to be doing. What are you doing for God's sake in the world? What are you doing for God's sake in this world? In this Nigerian society, you can't just be a member. Like I said, no backbenchers are welcome here. If you are used to being a backbencher, go elsewhere. The Lord wants to share with others. He wants us to share with others what we ourselves have received from him. We can't receive and sit down there. No. Those Christ sent out today we are the simple followers like you like everybody sitting down here not the specialists 
You see, the specialists were 12, isn't it? The 70 or 72 sent out were not the 12. They were the people who gathered around like you here. If you consider me a specialist, if you consider Bishop a specialist, those are not the people Jesus sent out into this gospel. Do you understand? Turn to one another and ask, do you recognize it is people like you that Jesus sent out? Therefore, do not leave the work of Christ to only the specialists, to priests and pastors and evangelists and missionaries. No. A real relationship with Christ must bear fruit in evangelization, must impact positively on others, must lead to the dissemination of gospel values. When you enter any house, let your first words be what? Peace be with you. So, as disciples, we are meant to be ambassadors of peace and reconciliation in a world of conflict and division. We are meant to be promoters of love and forgiveness in a world of hatred and vengeance. We are meant to be champions of human dignity and nonviolence in a world of violence and human degradation. We are meant to be agents of truth and justice in a world of widespread falsehood and injustice. We are meant to be messengers of healing and restoration in a world of sickness and pain. Yes, do you realize that there are things which will remain undone if you don't do them? Once again, ask your neighbor, do you realize that there are things that will remain undone if you, meaning you, call his or her name, if you don't do them? There are things that will remain undone if you don't do them because Father George will not do them. It is only you that is meant to do them. It is only you, Joseph. It is only you, Chukuma. It is only you, Cecilia. It is only you, Hassan, that can do them. I, I will not do them because the things I'm meant to do are different. There are things that will remain undone if you do not do them. What are you doing in the world and in the church for Christ's sake? No one should come here and just go home and continue life as usual. The harvest is rich, plentiful. The laborers are few. What are you doing in the world and in the church for Christ's sake? Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. Oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to consume as to console, to be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is despair, let me give you all hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. Oh, Master, grant that I may never see. So much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled and to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we glorify your holy name. Thank you for today. Thank you for the gospel of today that challenges us to go out there that the laborers 
are few. The harvest is plentiful. Thank you that you address this gospel to everyone, every follower. Not just to specialists. Help my people to understand that each one of us has a stake in the spreading of the gospel. Help my people to embrace the call to be missionary. Help my people to embrace the call to be witnesses of the gospel by the quality of their lives, by the quality of our words, by the quality of our actions. Heavenly Father, you seek to transform this sick society, this corrupt society, this degenerate society with Christians who are meant to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Help us to be salt of the earth. Help us to be light of the world. Grant us the grace for without you we can do nothing. For unless you build a house, the laborers labor in vain. Help us not to labor in vain. Instead, may our work bear fruits to the glory of your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.